And then that documentary came out, it became the number one documentary, and from then on, I mean, bodybuilding really took off. The amount of gymnasiums that were built, the amount of magazines that were printed, the amount of food supplements that were uh, uh, created. Uh, it really, the whole thing just took off, and it was like this huge kind of rise in bodybuilding. And this is why now, this is still going on. And this is why it was so important for us to come over to Asia. And uh, one of my favorite cities is Hong Kong, obviously, so I'm a bit prejudiced here. And uh, I just thought it has the greatest combination, and this is why when we found this location, in this hall here, this exhi exhibition, exhibition hall, we were so excited. So it's great to be here now in Asia, and it's great to have all of you, and it's great to hear the great reaction yesterday when we had the competitions out there. The men's and women's competition, the world's most strongest man competition, and all those things. And to see you all here today, so early in the morning. So thank you very much, and I'm very excited to be here. Thank you all. When you talk about how far the industry's come, of course, back in the day when you travelled and were promoting pumping iron, there's no way you could find a city with a gymnasium, let alone one that was open 24 hours, let alone one at a, at a hotel or the school. And it must be very satisfying to know that via your fitness crusade now, everywhere we go, there's gymnasiums. Well, this fitness crusade was not uh, without obstacles. And with all of those, that's why we call it the crusade, because it's a battle. It's not something that where people just open up the doors and you walk in and they say, welcome. I totally understand your message. I love what you're talking about. It was none of that. Believe me, in the beginning, when I came to America, I remember, people didn't even know exactly what bodybuilding was. I mean, they would look at you and they say, hey, are you a wrestler? <laughs> are you a football player? Are you a rugby player? Uh, are you a bouncer? Uh, what are you? The last thing they ever would mention is bodybuilding. And it was not popular. And the reason was is because bodybuilders, for some reason or the other, maybe they've read some negative stories about bodybuilding and therefore didn't want to do interviews. Or they were shy and they didn't feel comfortable sitting in front of a television camera. Or they didn't trust a journalist from the LA Times or the New York Times or something like that, and uh, felt intimidated. Whatever the reasons were, I have no idea. But they just didn't do interviews. So people, I believe very strongly, that someone has to fill the bucket. If you don't fill it, if you don't fill it up, someone else will. So this is why I thought that the bodybuilding and the federation and the bodybuilders should fill up that bucket. <clears throat> not the media without knowing anything. And so what has happened is, is that it went in the wrong direction and no one really knew what it was. And so when I started promoting bodybuilding, you can imagine at the beginning it was like, no, no, don't do that, you get muscle bound. It's not good for athletics. You get stiff. You cannot move as well. It would hinder your performance. So no one in athletics was allowed to do weight training. Then there were those that said that you would turn gay <laughs> if you work out in the gym. <laughs> and that hurt me. <laughs> but anyway, others thought that you would become a narcissist. That you start being so in love with yourself because you have to look in the mirror. They didn't understand that ballet dancers are doing their training in front of a mirror, and we in bodybuilding have to do our training in front of a mirror to see if you do the exercise the right way. It had nothing to do with narcissism. So there were all these misconceptions that said, don't do it. And the doctors would say that you get a heart attack when you do uh, weight training, that's not healthy. And now roll forward 45 years. Now you have in the hospitals weight resistance rooms for rehabilitation after surgery. All of a sudden the doctors are all talking about how great this is. And they themselves are working out in the gym. Now you see in every high school, every university, a weight room 
huge gymnasiums. Every military base has huge gymnasiums. Every fire station, every police station, every single hotel. Now you can travel around the world and every single hotel has a weight facility. So imagine what has happened in these last 40 years. So it has been totally accepted. It has been a very successful crusade. So this is where we started from with absolutely nothing, really. And then we slowly built it up that it is now this giant thing. And of course, you know, being from Australia, what has happened in Australia alone in this last 30, 40 years. I mean, there were rinky-dink gymnasiums in Australia when I was there in the 70s. Now, you, for instance, your clubs that you have all over Melbourne, I mean, they're giant, giant gymnasiums with the most sophisticated equipment. So no matter where you go today, in the hotel that I'm staying in right now, I can go downstairs to the weight room and I can have a full workout. They have great resistance machines, free weights, and everything, life cycles, ellipticals, everything. But no matter where you go, if you go to Africa, if you go to the Middle East, if you go to Asia, if you go to Europe, if you go, no matter where it is, you can find in every hotel room a training place. So this is the kind of changes that we went through. So it's, it's really extraordinary. And I think that you will see even much more in the next 10 years. A much, I mean, it's, it's accelerating and more and more people are getting involved. And this is what the Arnold Expo and Fitness uh, Festival is all about, is to bring different sports together and to say, you don't have to just do weight training, but anything, we just appreciate that you do anything, get off the couch, get out of the house, and do some exercise, some form of exercise, and participate. It's amazing, Arnold, but you, you wouldn't take no for an answer. While the other guys wouldn't do interviews, you were knocking down doors to do interviews. I mean, it was a kid seeing you on television. It was the first time I saw a bodybuilder. I think a lot of people have followed you because of, of, of how much work you did, not just with bodybuilding, but also when you went to promote a movie, you didn't just sit back and In 1967, 68, 69, <laughs> 70, 71. But after five Mr. Universe titles, there was still no money in bodybuilding. I was a construction worker. In 1971, I was a construction worker with Franco Colombo. We were working doing bricklaying jobs. We put an ad in the LA Times. I didn't even know how to do bricklaying jobs. I mean, Franco. Colombo was the expert in that, right? That's what he studied. We put an ad in the newspaper, in the LA Times. And they called us because we call ourselves European experts in marble work and in <laughs> bricklaying and fireplaces and patio building and all this stuff. And so they called us. And luckily, all of a sudden there was a huge earthquake in LA. <laughs> and they wiped out a lot of the chimneys and walls and everything. So then we get a lot of phone calls and our business was like skyrocketing, just booming. And Frank and I, we were so busy, we even had to hire some of the bodybuilders from the gym to work for us, which was not a good idea because they were lazy bumps. They just wanted to lie out in the sun during the day and we would make the work. But anyway, so this is just to show to you that Bodybuilding, I didn't do it for the money. I was passionate about it. It felt great to have muscles. It felt great to compete. It felt great to go to the gym and to be able to squat with 500 pounds and to be a world champion. It had nothing to do with money. Of course, having had a business mind, I said, Mr. we got to make bodybuilding like the other sports and make it really acceptable and make raise the cash prices and the competitions and really build the business so that there's a lot of money for future bodybuilders. Maybe not for us, but for future bodybuilders. And it worked. The day bodybuilding champions make a million dollars a year. They make a lot of money from endorsements. They have some, many times their own products if they have a little bit of business mind. They're going around doing exhibitions. They travel around and they're competing. They're getting money when they win the competition. So there's a lot of money available today in bodybuilding. They get into movies. Look at the amount of uh, uh, bodybuilders now are into acting and doing TV shows and uh, movies and all this stuff. And they're very, very talented. So I'm very proud of how far we have come in this whole thing. But I mean, the bottom line is, is it doesn't have that much to do with money. The money will always come. But the first and most important thing is you've got to be passionate of what you do. And I was always passionate 
about bodybuilding, I was always passionate about acting. Uh, it's so much fun to play a character. It's so much fun to get ready for a character, to really get into it, and to work with great directors and with great producers and uh, great co-stars. And it was also so much fun to then jump over to from uh, acting to politics. Because I know at that point how satisfying it is when you do something for someone else. You know, it's great to do something for yourself, but it feels even better if you do something for someone else. And I just coincidentally got involved with Special Olympics and started becoming a coach and training people that were mentally handicapped, or what they say in the old days, retarded, mentally handicapped, now we call it uh, intellectually challenged. So whatever you call it, whatever is the politically correct way to say it, but the bottom line is it's for people that needed help. And they needed to be taken out of the institutions and made participate in sports like Special Olympics. And it was wonderful to see the kind of work that was done worldwide. And it made me feel good to go and to train with Special Olympians and to show them the weight training and I became the international weightlifting coach for them. And to see kids who were afraid of the bar, but then all of a sudden, within no time, to put the, they can put the bar on their chest, they would doing bench press. Then you put some extra plates on it, they did some more bench press. And then they asked for more plates. And, they, and you could see the improvement and how they gained confidence within a shorter period of time. And you go home at night and you say to yourself, that felt so good. I didn't make a dollar. But it felt so good training those kids and making them feel confident and learning something new and seeing that great smile on their face. You know, so I knew that public service and reaching out and doing something for other people that need help was a really satisfying thing to do. And the same was also with studying after school programs. When I recognized in America that uh, we didn't have really a great system. I mean, it was great to see both parents going to work. That women can go and find jobs and get work, that they're fighting for equality and equal chances and equal pay and all those things, and those are great. But what about the kids? Who is at home in the afternoon? Kids get out of school at three o'clock and all of a sudden they're roaming around the streets. They're getting involved in teenage pregnancy, in crime. Juvenile crime, alcohol, drugs, gangs, violence, no supervision. Because 70% of the kids come from a home where both of the parents are working. So there's no one home. So I started creating after school programs, programs for kids after three o'clock when they finish from school so that their school stays open and they have coaches there and they have teachers there and they have mentors there and they have tutors there. So from three to six, you know, the kids can stay somewhere and get adult supervision and get the tutoring and the homework of help and all of the stuff normally parents do to get it in the schools. It's been hugely successful. It's now nationwide and, you know, we're raising millions of dollars for that. And then there was an initiative in California where we raised $500 million uh, a year for that. So all this stuff. So I knew how great it feels when you do this kind of work for people and there was no money involved. You know, so then, of course, the next thing was, it was natural to go and start running for governor and to jump in there and to run the state of California. Well, it's obviously that you've got passion, and that might be the, what separates you from everybody else, but throughout your life, you, you've had these big dreams. So when you're a kid in the village in Austria, you, you dream about being Mr. Universe, the best built man in the world. But when you become the best built man in the world, you're already studying acting, and you're already studying that craft and planning your next move. So you said that nothing's happening by accident. You didn't get lucky. I think a lot of people look at your life and well, I don't got lucky. But when you were laying bricks and going to school and learning English and all these kind of things at the same time, you were going to acting school. And in the whole time you were doing acting, you were studying politics, watching all that very, very closely. So is it, is it the passion that separates you from everybody else that has a dream or is it just the fact that you don't?